Good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much, Rachel, for the introduction. And I, I particularly want to recognize the efforts of Tom Hilditch in putting this together. It's uh, unbelievable to see this many people in a room on, uh, on the topic, but not unexpected. But uh, congratulations to Tom and his, his team in particular. So I think we, each of us have been asked to give you a perspective on uh, the Endangered Species Act, and that's uh, what I intend to do. I'm not going to go through in any level of detail, particularly given the comment we just heard on, on the ins and outs of the regulatory approach for hydro. Uh, I'm going to give you opinion more than anything, uh, I think, over the next little while, but I, I will give you some context. So do I point this at you? So a little bit of who we are. As Rachel said, uh, we're a not-for-profit, non-government organization. I like to think that we're an NGO. It depends, of course, what the letter E stands for, energy, electricity, economy, and I would argue the environment. We represent 99% of the installed electric, uh, hydroelectric capacity in the province of Ontario, and our members include uh, legal, environmental, engineering, construction, and increasingly uh, Aboriginal communities. Uh, my job is to focus on public policy affecting our sector, the hydroelectric sector in the province of Ontario. And that's where I intersect with the Endangered Species Act, uh, dating back to 2006, 2007, when the act was being designed. As Rachel said, uh, I also sit on the Species at Risk uh, Program Advisory Committee, as does uh, Rachel and some other folks here uh, today. And uh, I was also a participant in the development of a, an ESA panel report that may have got lost a little bit in the, uh, the series of EBR postings. If you haven't read that report yet, it was a group of us, uh, some of us uh, here today, uh, who were tasked with the responsibility of considering our advice to government with respect to the evolution of the Endangered Species Act, in particular its implementation. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the EBR posting. It was, I think, sent out on uh, early January. So, my overarching view of the world, not just on endangered species, is one of an adaptive management construct. I know most people in this room probably uh, intuitively uh, think about that in the context of natural resource management, but I think about it in the context of legislation, regulation, and policy as well. It's a fundamental business concept, regardless of what sphere you're operating in. Uh, so I think it's an entirely appropriate, and in fact, I think it's a, a fact of good governance that periodically uh, the province looks at its legislative, regulatory, and policy frameworks and asks the question, is it doing what we intended it to do? Uh, so I, I do believe that the, uh, the efforts of the government to, to have a look at the implementation of the Act are entirely appropriate, and I, I think they should do it with all legislation periodically, quite frankly. Too often in my experience, and Rachel talked about spending some time in the public service, what I've seen is that we create a piece of legislation, uh, think that it's going to work for time immemorial, and don't get back to it for 20 or 30 years, and then we blow it up because it's not working. Uh, so I don't see this as a threat to the Endangered Species Act and its intention uh, at all. I think, in fact, it's a, it's a testament of good governance. I also think, and I said I was a participant on the ESA review panel and I sit on SARPAC, that I think all of us, uh, all of us in this room, and certainly all of us in our sector, are committed to the protection and recovery of species in Ontario. I don't think that's a question. Uh, I haven't run into somebody yet who, uh, either in our sector and uh, people that I've worked with on this file who said, you know what, well, that's just not a good idea. Uh, so I start from that proposition as well. And thirdly, I don't believe government could or can do everything. I don't think that's the role of government. That's where I come philosoph from philosophically. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm right or left or center. It just means that I don't think it's reasonable to expect government to do everything. I think we have an obligation as certainly our sector and as citizens to contribute to the objectives of the legislative frameworks, be they ESA, be they green energy in our situation, uh, regardless. So uh, when I hear people react to you know, a change in direction one way or the other, and underlying that is, is a fundamental fear that government uh, isn't going to play the role it used to, roll, uh, used to play, uh, I, I question uh, whether or not that's the right approach to the, uh, to the providing solutions. So, how did we think about the Endangered Species Act when it was introduced? Uh, and I certainly was part of the conversation, our sector was back in 2007. Uh, we started the uh, question of the Endangered Species Act by trying to frame the question for our sector. What did that look like? It looked like uh, uh, commissioning an analysis of all of the uh, listed species 
in the province of Ontario, both those that were on the previous legislation, those were coming forward, doing a geospatial analysis of all the hydroelectric facilities in the province, data mining the, uh, uh, the Natural Resource uh, Values Information uh, Centre, NERVIS, uh, and existing um, scientific uh, documentation to determine where and if hydroelectric facilities and species at risk intersected. That was our start. We did that work and then we gave that work to government. And then we fact-checked that work with government to make sure that we were on the same page to begin with. Back to my previous point, we could have expected government to do that, but quite frankly, I don't know that they could have done it for all of the activities and all of the species uh, with the introduction of the legislation. I think that's our role as an industry, quite frankly. We then took what I think is a, is a pretty targeted approach to uh, hydroelectricity and, and species at risk. And this is articulated uh, under Regulation 24208 for built and approved hydro facilities. Government made a, a strategic choice to retroactively apply the Endangered Species Act to all of our hydroelectric facilities in the province. We have many facilities that are more than 100 years old. The average age of the operating facilities are about uh, 60 years, and the last big uh, hydroelectric development era was about 20 years ago. Thankfully for my job, we're back into hydroelectric development again now, but my point is that government could have chosen otherwise. They could have grandfathered all the existing hydroelectric facilities. They could have grandfathered a bunch of different activities, and they didn't. They took proactive measures for new construction of facilities. So if we're building a new facility where there's a listed species and it's known to be there, we're subject to the legislation, which is the same as any other activity uh, is. And the regulation isn't an exemption. Uh, it's unfortunate language in terms of uh, the body of the regulatory framework and the legislation itself, but it doesn't exempt our industry from species protection and, and recovery. In fact, it does the opposite. It requires all of our existing facilities that happen to intersect listed species to take action, uh, to mitigate, to monitor, and report, uh, and not to threaten the recovery of species at risk in Ontario. I think that's a step forward as opposed to uh, a step in the opposite direction. And I know there's lots of conversation about exemptions and things like that. M my advice to you is to have a look at what's actually being said. And then what we did is we developed what we believe to be the most reasonable and reasoned approach to dealing with the question. We looked at what the uh, key species are, were for our sector, and there were, there's really two, but there are a number of others, uh, Lake Sturgeon and American Eel. We partnered with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the Ministry of Natural Resources, and we commissioned the best available science and information with respect to the question of how do you deal with the integration or uh, intersection of species at risk, in this case, Lake Sturgeon and American Eel and hydroelectric facilities. And what you'll find if you read these documents, and I brought copies of them with me if people are interested, you can certainly order them from us, is that that's not an easy question to answer necessarily. There isn't a magic solution uh, to those questions. In fact, it's a hypothesis of effects construct that you'll find in these documents. If you're thinking about this, or if the reaction is that, you know, look at this. The other thing you'll find in these documents, and I'll get to this point a little bit later with respect to where we're headed, is that the science is still evolving, and that we need to continue to inform and update our information on these uh, types of questions. We've done similar work on channel darter. Uh, we just published a series on construction guidelines, and we're working now on an effectiveness monitoring framework uh, for Lake Sturgeon. We did see some unintended consequences, and this is likely a theme you'll hear. Uh, I haven't seen everybody else's slide decks, but certainly one that I've heard. Uh, unintended consequences of good intentions. So I, get, I go back to the, the adaptive management construct for legislation. What we saw in our sector was brand new, lengthy process requirements were triggered for us to do anything uh, in, in the interest of uh, species at risk. We saw action in the absence of direction. So we were spending time, effort, and money and resources on the ground in the absence of knowing whether or not those time, that time, effort, and resources actually meant anything because we had to react to the, the uh, requirements of the legislation. And one, and I think you'll hear this uh, throughout the next couple of days, is we were forced to look at this question facility by facility, species by species, right? That's the model of the legislation. It's this facility, this species, this facility, this species, one by one by one by one. It really challenges the ability to take a collective broader view uh, of uh, what's in the best interest of species. We saw a great conflict between theoretical and practical. One of the challenges that I've seen in this uh, piece of legislation is that we tend to say it's science-based legislation, and certainly that's something we support. 
but the science that it's premised on is pr primarily natu natural science. It's not engineering science. It's a whole new discipline that we think should be part of the conversation. So you can have the best theoretical idea in the world. If it doesn't work from an engineering science perspective, in our case, you're going to spend a lot of time and effort uh, going down a road that goes nowhere. And I'll have to say, quite frankly, is, is um, generally I see confidence in the legislation waning. I really do. I, and that's unfortunate. Uh, uh, with respect to what the legislation, the promise of the legislation, the gold standard, the flexibility tools. But if you talk to John Q. Public, I live in rural Ontario, maybe that's why they, I talk to those kinds of people. But I think we have a confidence crisis in this piece of legislation. Uh, I think we need to try to get that back. What does a current framework look like for us? It actually builds on what's already in place. So it builds on what's in place for, under Regulation 24208 that I talked about before. So it still up, retroactively applies to existing facilities. If there's a new species listed or found in a, on a facility in the province tomorrow, it goes backwards. Uh, 40, 50, 100 years old, no matter how long the facility is, is there. And I think an important um, addition for us, at least in my analysis of what the uh, regulatory approach talks about is the addition of a requirement associated with effectiveness monitoring. We think that's a good start. We think that, in fact, will help us inform the best management practices over time. Uh, we're already taking measures in that regard with respect to lake sturgeon, uh, so we brought together all of our facility owners and operators who may have uh, an intersection of their species with lake sturgeon or their habitat. We again worked with Ministry of Natural Resources, Fisheries Oceans Canada, and what we're trying to design is a collective effectiveness monitoring framework. So we're measuring things consistently, so we're reporting things consistently, and so we're informing a broader body of knowledge as opposed to facility by facility, species by species, experiment by, by experiment. And it does provide, in my view, additional impetus for us as the representative organization on behalf of the sector. We need to continue to do what we're doing with respect to uh, analyzing where our, our, uh, our uh, best management practices lie and, uh, and moving those efforts forward. And I wanted to end with a final perspective. This isn't mine, but I think it's good news. Um, this is a recent Timmins, I think, weekly paper article with respect to Lake Sturgeon. I'm not going to read it all. There's two points that I'd like to make in this, uh, however, though. Um, the first is, if you look at the groups who are involved in this, so this is a collective effort, right? This is the hydro industry, this is the mining industry, this is the local uh, fur managers federation, this is the naturalists, this is the Ministry of Natural Resources. It's a collective effort. It's the only way we're going to do anything on this file, in my view, uh, and that's together. The second point I want to make on this is look when this started. 2002, they started this effort. In 2002, we didn't have the Endangered Species Act as we know it now. So legislation, regulation, and policy in and of itself shouldn't be driving our behavior around this. In fact, it hasn't. We've been at this for a while, and I think if you talk to some other proponents on the ground, they've been at this for a while, with or without the overarching body of legislation to drive it. Does it provide context? Absolutely. Uh, does it put some discipline in the system? Absolutely. But we're doing this because it's the right thing to do, not because we're, we're told to do it under legislation, regulation, or policy. So thanks for your time and attention. I uh, look forward to the rest of the panel presentation and to your questions.